Step back in time with me today and we'll witness the resilience of history's oldest buildings. From the world's oldest lighthouse, the Tower of Hercules, to the Colosseum's legendary gladiatorial battles. Let's discover the secrets and bizarre stories behind five ancient structures that have truly stood the test of time. Located in Acaruna, Galicia, in Spain, the Tower of Hercules is the world's oldest lighthouse. It was built by the Romans in the 1st or 2nd century AD, and it has been in continuous use for nearly 2,000 years. Until the 20th century, the lighthouse was known as the Farum Brigantium, the name given to it by the Romans. The word Farum in the tower's original name comes from the Greek Pharos, the name given to the lighthouse of Alexandria. This wasn't just some boasting on the part of Roman architects who saw fit to compare their work to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world either. It was named this because the Tower of Hercules was built using the original plans for the Lighthouse of Alexandria, just on a smaller scale. The lighthouse currently stands at 55 meters, 180 feet, though the original design was only 34 meters or 112 feet tall. The additional fourth story was added in the late 1700s when the tower underwent renovations. Despite these renovations, the original ancient Roman core of the structure has been fully preserved and tourists can see the nearly 2,000-year-old masonry contained within the lighthouse's new outer shell. Even though the structure has been in use for so long, it actually has a pretty quiet history. The Romans just built a really good lighthouse, and it's been in continuous use since its construction. And that's kind of the whole story here. It's old, it works, they kept using it. This isn't actually too surprising since it was built using the plans for the Lighthouse of Alexandria, a tower that stood for over a thousand years and took five major earthquakes to bring it down. If you're wondering where Hercules fits into any of this, the new name for the lighthouse comes from one of the several creation myths surrounding the structure. According to one myth, Hercules engaged in continuous combat for three days and three nights with the giant tyrant Geryon. After slaying the giant, his head was buried and Hercules ordered a town, including the lighthouse, to be built on top of the buried skull. Renaming the lighthouse could be seen as a slight to Gaius Servius Lupus, the man oh, we know served as chief architect on the project thanks to an inscription on the original cornerstone, but Spain's Ministry of Tourism may have just felt that the Tower of Hercules was a cooler name. And to be fair, Tower of Lupus doesn't exactly have the same ring to it. In the center of Rome stands the ruins of the most famous amphitheater ever built, the Colosseum. If you've ever seen a portrayal of ancient Rome, you've undoubtedly seen depictions of gladiatorial combat taking place in the Colosseum. This was just one of the theater's many uses by the Romans. In addition to battles between gladiators, the Colosseum was also used to showcase hunting exhibitions and public executions. On occasion, the building would even be flooded and used to reenact battles because apparently already didn't have enough going on. Built in the 1st century AD, the six-acre Colosseum was similar in size to a modern-day football stadium. The arena floor was 87 meters by 55 meters, 287 by 180 feet, very close to the size of a football field. The entire structure was 189 meters long, 156 meters wide, and 48 meters tall, and it had a maximum capacity of about 85,000 spectators. While the Colosseum has remained in use, the days of hunting and gladiatorial combat came to a close by the end of the 6th century, and it has served different purposes since then. For several centuries, the arena was used as a cemetery, while the arcades were converted into homes and workshops. Then it was taken over by the powerful Frangipani family, who used it as a castle. By the mid-14th century, Rome was in decline, and the Colosseum mainly served as a popular squatting location for groups of bandits. This was the same time that a massive earthquake caused much of the structure to fall into ruin. Starting in the 16th century, the Catholic Church tried to revitalize the location. Early proposals included turning it into a wool factory or a bullfighting arena, but none of these projects ever came to fruition. In 1749, Pope Benedict XIV installed the Stations of the Cross in the Colosseum, a series of 14 carvings depicting the events on the day of Jesus' execution. This is one of its modern-day uses, and every year on Good Friday, over 10,000 people will visit the Colosseum as the Pope leads them in the Stations of the Cross. Though the stations were first installed in 1749, this didn't become an annual tradition until 1964. Of course, the Colosseum was built as a venue for live performances, and indeed it still serves that role today, albeit in a really, really limited capacity. 
Though the likes of Elton John, Ray Charles, and Billy Joel have performed at the Coliseum, the building itself is used as a backdrop for these larger concerts, with the event actually taking place outside. Live performances do still take place within the Coliseum walls, but the days of 85,000 people showing up are long since over thanks to the building's extensive damage. So much of the Coliseum has been damaged that the venue itself can now only hold a few hundred people using temporary seating. Ancient Egypt is known for its incredible amount of immense structures that have stood the test of time. But other than being tourist destinations or sites of archaeological research, they aren't really doing very much. Each temple was generally dedicated to a specific god or pharaoh. So as belief in ancient gods waned, so too did any utility of those temples. We can't even say that the pyramids are technically still in use as tombs, seeing as most of them were entirely cleaned out long before modern archaeologists had a chance to ship their mummies off to the British Museum. Now the exception to this is the Luxor Temple, built on the east bank of the Nile River in ancient Thebes, what is now modern-day Luxor. The temple was originally constructed in approximately 1400 BC by Amenhotep III. Additions on the temple complex were commissioned by Tutankhamun and Ramesses II, though that construction uh, would have been completed during the 1200s BC. Unlike most other Egyptian temples, Luxor Temple was dedicated to the rejuvenation of kingship rather than to any particular deity. Some historians believe this may be the official location where the pharaohs were crowned, at least figuratively. At least some of this speculation comes from the fact that Alexander the Great claimed to have been crowned at Luxor, despite evidence that he may have never personally traveled that far south. The temple was built with a type of sandstone known as Nubian sandstone, quarried in southwest Egypt. They would have needed a lot of it because the complex is massive. When it came to ancient construction projects, the Egyptians oh, weren't going to let anyone outdo them in terms of sheer size. When the Romans conquered Egypt, the complex was first turned into a fortress and government building before the temple itself was converted into a Catholic church in 395 AD. It was then converted to the Mosque of Abu Hagag in 640, and that mosque is still in use today. Though the religion may have changed a couple of times, the Luxor Temple has been home to religious worship continuously for over 3,400 years. The temple is regarded as the oldest building in the world that is at least partially active for anything other than tourism or archaeological research. As we'll get to shortly, that impressive distinction is entirely dependent on how we choose to use the word. Horiyuji Temple is the youngest building in today's video, but it has one special characteristic that separates it from all of the others. Everything else we've mentioned, as well as the final entry in today's episode, share a single common characteristic that is largely expected of millennia old man made structures. They're all made of stone. Now, wood was used in many different parts of the Colosseum, such as the arena floor, but by and large, the main structure was built of stone. Horiyuji Temple, on the other hand, is made of wood. First constructed in 607, it is widely acknowledged as the world's oldest wooden building. Of course, things have to be slightly more complicated than that, though. In total, the entire temple complex contains nearly 30 buildings. The two main buildings are the five-story pagoda and the condo, or main hall. In 670, all of the buildings were burned down after a lightning strike. The condo was the first to be rebuilt, and that specific building has the distinction of being the oldest wooden building in the world. The original construction was commissioned by Prince Shotoku. The complex was built as a Buddhist temple, though it became the key location in the rise of the cult of Shotoku, a sect of Buddhism focused on venerating the late prince. Aside from that early fire in 670, and despite being made of wood, the actual buildings themselves seem to have suffered very little hardship. The next major repairs didn't take place until the 14th and 17th century. When Japan made Shinto the official state religion in 1868, Horiyuji Temple began suffering from a lack of funding. In order to ensure the preservation of the temple, the monks had to sell some of the ancient treasures housed in the temple to museums. They used this money to fund conservation efforts, and in 1934, a massive restoration project began. This was halted during World War II, when some parts of the temple were disassembled and hidden to protect them. Fortunately, the United States had a policy not to bomb important cultural sites. Today, Horiyuji Temple is still in use as a Buddhist temple and has the headquarters of the Shotoku sect of Buddhism there. It's also a major tourist attraction and in 1993 was named as Japan's first UNESCO World Heritage Site. But it's not just the historic temple itself that draws tourists to this location. In addition to being a place of worship, Horiyuji Temple is home to over 180 of Japan's designated national treasures. Sassi di Matera 
We've talked about some pretty old buildings, but nothing can compare to the homes of Sassi de Matera, two districts in what's now the Italian city of Matera. These prehistoric homes have been in near continuous use since they were first constructed in 7000 BC. If you're wondering how Stone Age people from the Paleolithic period could have built something that would still be standing and housing people over 9000 years later, well, the answer's simple. They technically didn't build them because they're caves. The homes were dug into calcarinetic rock, a form of limestone, on the slope of a ravine created by the Gravina River. This is where the name Sassi comes from, literally translating to stones. The proximity to water, combined with both the durability of limestone and the ease with which it can be carved, made this a perfect location for the troglodyte settlement. In addition to the houses that were carved into the stone, the early inhabitants also created primitive roads. Many of these roads ran on top of the houses. The Sassi looked a bit like a Stone Age high-rise apartment complex, with caves stacked on top of one another up to ten levels high. Unfortunately, despite being an impressive feat of prehistoric engineering, these dwellings did leave quite a bit to be desired. There was no natural light, no ventilation, no running water. The residents did have access to clean water thanks to a remarkable system they built, but they would have had to leave their caves to access it. This was less than ideal given that a single room cave would normally be home to both an entire a family and also their livestock, which sounds uh, unpleasant. While the Sassi may not have been luxury condominiums, they were enough to serve as a community of as many as 30,000 residents continuously for nearly 9,000 years. Then in 1950, the Italian government got involved. Even in 1950, there was not yet any running water or electricity. Other residents were extremely poor and diseases, particularly malaria, ran rampant and resulted in levels of infant mortality that were comparable to ancient times. The government decided that the living conditions were inhumane and forcibly removed the residents. Over the ensuing decades, renovations got underway to make the Sassi habitable again, while also preserving the historic significance of these ancient dwellings. Beginning in the 1980s, people began moving back, and there are roughly 3,000 permanent residents again. That 30 to 40 year period in the mid 1900s is the only time in a period spanning over 9,000 years that these prehistoric caves were not inhabited. Now Sassi de Matera is a popular tourist destination. There are shops, restaurants, hotels, and even electricity. And even if you've never heard of this city before, there's a good chance you've seen it. Because the ancient homes are reminiscent of sites around Jerusalem, the Sassi has been featured in several movies set in biblical times such as The Passion of the Christ and The Nativity Story. Or if you prefer summer blockbusters to religious-themed movies, it was also the location of the Amazonian city in the 2017 Wonder Woman film. While we could debate whether or not the Sassi technically qualify as buildings, these caves were absolutely man-made. Were it not for that brief interruption, beginning in 1950, Sassi de Matera would comfortably hold the title of the world's oldest continually inhabited city by at least 2,000 years.